Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting startup founders share their stories and strategies. They also deliver tangible lessons learned along the way that you can apply to your own startup. Each episode is a true masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. Morning started. This is Kevin Pruitt with an encore episode of Rising Tide Startups, and one of my favorite guests has taken just done me a solid to uh, come back on the show. It's AJ Wilcox. AJ, thanks again for rising, coming on Rising Tide. Oh, Kevin, I am absolutely flattered that you'd invite me back. Thanks for having me. So I look back and it's, it was July of 2019. So we're talking what, gosh, three years and two months ago that I think you were on the show. And man, it, you, so much has happened in that that period of time. I, I am an avid follower of you on LinkedIn. And I think you added a zero to your followers too, I, I think since that time. So it's <laughs> it's been amazing. I mean, I looked just before we we jumped on here and you're what, almost 28,000 followers on LinkedIn. That That is just incredible. Yeah. That is truly incredible. I know that, you know, that it's not 28,000 of your closest friends, but this just to have that kind of interest in, in what you're doing on LinkedIn. But man, just take time to kind of set the stage for us. Just remind everyone a little bit who you are and where you are and what you do. Sounds great. Well, as Kevin said, my name is AJ Wilcox. I run an ad agency called B2Linked.com, and we are the LinkedIn ads agency. Uh, started back in 2014. Um, we're the first and only LinkedIn ads agency, uh, and it's, it's been really, really fun ever since. We, because we have hyper-focused on LinkedIn, we've gotten to work with many of LinkedIn's largest spending clients, have some really good relationships there. Uh, we're official LinkedIn partners. I'm the host of the LinkedIn Ads Show podcast. That's been uh, you know somewhat new. <laughs> um, so I think that started around. We're on episode 73 right now, so it's yeah, yeah, you know, around the beginning of COVID when we started that. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the big step. So been working really hard on growing the team, continuing to share everything and anything that we learn about LinkedIn Ads, and it seems like the market has really picked up on it used to be that LinkedIn ads was like this, you know, third tier platform you might consider if you've already mm. tried everything else. And now we're seeing a lot more interest in the platform. It's become a first tier platform for B2B, which is, I think, exactly where it's belong. Yeah. I And you probably recognize that long before the rest of us did, but um, just being on different social networks, I mean, there is such a difference in the interactions in, and for the most part. I mean, there's always the outliers and trolls, but um, I've just... I have almost exclusively moved off of everything else other than just LinkedIn because it's just it's you know you can you can control the the content you control your your timeline a little bit more and just by saying you know I'm not interested in that here it's why I'm not interested in that and you know so stop showing me this stuff and it just really really has been interesting to see um, how I've really narrowly focused even just my interests you know in in LinkedIn but. Man, just tell me the. I mean, we talked a little bit about this the last time, but I, this is this is such a good time, I think, to cycle back, especially you know three years later. But tell me how LinkedIn has kind of positioned itself to be this premier ad spot, you know, that that is really able to compete with the other social networks because you know people have always said, man, I'd I'd love to advertise on LinkedIn. It's just too expensive you know, or it's, it's yeah. to this, or, you know, fill, fill in the, the adjective, you know, whatever that is, but how have you navigated that against the other social networks? Well, I think LinkedIn has something really strong going for it. And I, I have, I have to say, I'm really good friends with several of the product people at LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to like discredit the work that they've been doing, but I'll make a, a claim and say, uh, the success of LinkedIn's ads platform over the last well, actually from the beginning, has next to nothing to do with how hard they're working or what features they're, they're releasing. The success of LinkedIn's ads platform goes 100% down to their audience, who mm -hmm. they have access to. Yeah. You know, when you are selling HR software, you don't need anyone else to see your ads other than decision makers in HR. Mm -hmm. And you have Facebook that Maybe you target an interest in HR, but it's getting everyone across the board. And Facebook doesn't know those signals about like what seniority you are. And are you a recruiter versus mm. are you like dealing with, with staff and talent or training? Um, like Facebook doesn't know those things. And so it's trying to create all these connections from what it knows about interaction, 
And Facebook does a great job of that. But ultimately, your sales team is going to have to disqualify like 95% of the leads that come in, even if they are cheaper, just because, you know, Facebook doesn't know who you are professionally. LinkedIn has known that from day one, the second you put your job title in yeah. um, and you say what company you work for, now they have you properly identified. So as an advertiser, even if it's a premium to advertise, I'm still making sure that every single one of my impressions that I'm paying for is going to an exact, you know, perfect ideal customer. Of yeah, mine. that that is that is such a great um I get a great answer to a question that probably wasn't very well crafted, but it it is such a uh, I mean it is such a unique platform and and just the 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 interaction you know behind the scenes of of the way it's kind of going through its algorithm is is truly amazing because it's so it's so focused on the business world you know I mean that that is its focus it's it's yes. like how do we digitize the Rolodex you know and <laughs> at the end of the day but. It is. I'd, I've got a funny story. I was. I actually posted a job, probably maybe right after I talked to you. And I, I, you know, you set the budget. I, I sat there and watched it, and it ate my budget in like four minutes. And oh. I'm going, okay, so either I did something major wrong here, or I should have candidates rolling out my <laughs> my ears here because it is. It's amazing how. I mean, it wasn't much that I, I budgeted for it, but it was amazing how quickly it just disappeared. But um, yeah, I, I certainly needed more more guidance on how to how to do that. But it is it is an amazing platform. I mean, at the end of the day, it's truly an amazing platform, and it's and it's the it is also it's not mindless scrolling. I mean, truly, there's there is value in a lot of the posts that I see, you know, people saying, here's, here's a quick slide deck on productivity or quick slide deck on how to manage people well or stuff like that. And it always leads to something else. So um, I, I certainly, I'm a, I'm a LinkedIn fanboy. I mean, it's, there's no doubt that it's, that it is a, a desired platform, but so what, how has it changed? I mean, you, you said you started in 2014, but it seems like that you kind of hit this, this, 2019 2020 point where I started seeing you involved in like more um you know external things like whether it's conferences or you were you know doing quick videos or that type of thing outside of just b2 linked I mean did you kind of see that inertia oh I wish I could um I think this all boils down to the fact that right when I started the company in 2014 I realized I am not a sales guy. I have no idea how to close a deal. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to acquire customers or how I'm going to sell them. But I do know that as a marketer, I know how to educate people. And yep. my goal was to share as much as possible for free until someone just relented and said, okay, fine. What's it going to cost to have you come Send and do check. this for me? Right. <laughs> exactly. And so that's been my goal from the very beginning. Um, when I grew up, quote unquote, uh, in digital marketing, I saw people on stage like Rand Fishkin mm -hmm. and Matt McGee and, and others that I was like, oh, as a, as a young Padawan, like that's what I want to be when I grow up. And so as soon as I was out on my own, funny story, I've, I've always wanted to speak on stages. And I, I went to my boss at my previous company and I, I told her like, hey, I'm, I'm being invited to speak at these conferences and this would be really cool. And she kind of shot me down and said, oh, the CEO has a very short list of people that he's comfortable like putting on stage to represent the company. So sorry, you're not approved. And so the second I, I got out, I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to go and pitch to speak at all of these conferences that I've mm. ever attended. Yeah. And I think I put out like 14 pitches my first year. One of them through a relationship came back and said, uh, sure, we'll take a flyer on you. I did well enough on that one that I was invited back the next year. And the next year I pitched again, another mm -hmm. like 12, 15, again, another one of them invited me. Um, and, and so it's all just compounded doubling, yeah. speaking at twice the number of conferences every year until back in 20, I think it was 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to back off from speaking. I mean, everyone had to back off during COVID, but uh, I realized that I was traveling, you know, 17 weeks of the year wow, yeah. and wasn't getting enough time with my, my kids. Yeah. Uh, and so at that point I, I kind of backed it off, but I think what you saw was the benefit of years and years and mm -hmm. years of, of small micro efforts that 
10 year overnight look success. Like, <laughs> exactly. And all of a sudden it looks like, wow, AJ came out of nowhere. He's doing big stuff. I, I've been doing stuff the whole time, but mm -hmm. um, finally a lot of people started to, to realize that it's, it's compounded. It's, you know, snowballed. No doubt. No doubt about it, friend. No, no doubt about that. I can, I can certainly see that, but it, it did see like there was an increase in activity, a visible activity. Maybe that's a better word. The, yeah. the whole idea that's like, maybe it's an iceberg above the water, you know, that the people were actually seeing, but tell me what's, uh, what's changed in the last two or three years that, uh, you know, how has B2 linked changed? I mean, obviously growth grown, but, uh, how did COVID kind of impact what you're trying to do and, and uh, what have you come or are you coming out of that? Well, last time you and I spoke, I'm pretty sure I had a team of of three, including myself. Uh, we're now a team of 12. So wow. we, we've grown nicely that way. Yeah. And, and actually, like now that I'm thinking about it, thinking back to about the time where you started seeing a lot more come out, out from me, um, I think that coincided with when I was able to hire a sales team. Mm -hmm. And so I was no longer on all the sales calls. So it freed me up. And, and I had a, a like two different directors who had accounts full of people. So they were fielding all the client questions. And so it freed me up to actually create content. So I, yeah. I think that's probably what happened. Like the perfect storm of visibility there. <laughs> yeah. Which is actually fantastic Yeah, uh, because right at the beginning of COVID um, just that first week of panic, we lost 40% of our clients like that. Mm. They were just gone. It was panic. We don't know what's going on. We have to cancel. And that's scary for a business yeah, to, to lose 40% of its customers. Um, so the next several months were tough, but it ended up coming back you know, with a vengeance and we grew the team larger than it had been before. And you know, we're not feeling that now. Thank goodness. The, it is, isn't it amazing? I mean, so, you know, you're certainly on involved, I think more on like the online space, you know, with, with, uh, with LinkedIn advertising and, and probably I, I would guess a lot of your clients are, are kind of online as well, but the, the whole idea of it was it was interesting to go through to see COVID. I mean, there was just like this immediate shutdown of everything. It's like the whole world stopped, kind of like, you know, planes stopped after 9-11, you know, that, that yeah. you know, this time it was the world. And but then all of a sudden, when the gate kind of got cracked a little bit, I mean, I've interviewed people on the show that say, man, we could not keep up with it when like people caught up it's like the airline industry right now they can't catch up with themselves now people want to get out they yeah. have a fever you know and they they just can't hire enough staff and and you know put enough planes in the air but did you see that a little bit say you know maybe late 2020 early to mid 2021 did you kind of see this people really coming out of this like hibernation so to speak and saying hey we got it we've got to get active here definitely what we saw in in middle of the year, um, like COVID panic was, was fairly early on. I think it was like March, April mm -hmm. might've been a little bit later, but, um, we lost a chunk of our clients, but then very quickly, we started seeing a lot of leads come in from companies, uh, who weren't digital. They were mm. very much analog yeah. and they had all of this budget that they used to spend on trade shows in person. You know, they go to a trade show and it's a, $60,000 or a $200,000 line item for everything that they do. And they're saying, we can't go in person anymore. LinkedIn is the only network that we're aware of where we can reach the same type of users with our content. And so we saw a lot of people who are offline coming back online. Uh, but definitely as soon as people, I mean, the economy was so good through COVID. Like yeah. we were in such a good spot financially. I, I would say if the COVID panic happened right now, right as we're kind of naturally headed into what appears to look like a recession, but I'm not mm -hmm. an economist. Um, I think it would have hurt a lot more, but because inflation was low, because like people had cash, the market had been good up to that point. Uh, I think people just kind of poked their, their nose out of the tent and said, are all the, <laughs> is all the fire gone? Okay, cool. Let's <laughs> resume and let's make up for everything we lost. That, that, that is a great, uh, I mean, just the awareness to see that, you know, that it's not the physical in person, you know, that now it has to be used more virtually. And what does that look like? And obviously yeah. you're a recipient of that, you know, that, of that blessing, so to speak, but uh, how, what is, what is one or two things that you have, I guess, learned through this um, that you think would be applicable that, that are really strong kind of business principles that, that really have 
um, you know, if you're as a CEO, if you're, you're talking to somebody that's a little further behind you on the journey or just getting started, what are one or two things that, that you think you've really, that have really been solidified in your mind, you know, that, that are kind of agnostic, you know, for industry, but just uh, ideas that you think would really be helpful to our listeners? Yeah. Um, uh, that initial 40% loss of our clients hurt really badly. And I would talk to a lot of other agency owners and, and it seemed to be across the board that agencies lost a lot of clients at that point. Um, but us losing 40, most of my friends who ran agencies were losing 10 to 20. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to the principle that everyone knows, but just diversification. Yeah. We were, we're kind of a little bit limited that way because we're a niche agency. We, a lot of our clients tend to be the same kind of people, but those agencies who had like uh, a bunch of e-commerce clients and then some B2B and then some B2C lead gen and then some uh, you know, anything else, any, any mm -hmm. other like area of marketing, um, when they lost their B2B customers or a certain segment, they still had the rest of the business to make it up. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's a big one. The other one that I'd hit on, and this, this all kind of happened for me miraculously, um, just the timing was good. It was around that same time where I had structured it so I could hand off sales to a sales team. I could hand off account management to a team of directors and account managers, um, which freed me up. So I'm so grateful it happened when it did um, mm -hmm. because I, I couldn't be out creating more. But the more I'm in the marketplace as the founder and kind of the brainchild behind like all of our strategies, the more I'm in the marketplace teaching, sharing, and being visible, the better it is for us long term. And the more accounts we're going to get, the more leads we're going to get, more sales. So uh, diversification is kind of my first one. But but also, like as a founder, don't overburden yourself so much to the, to the point where you can't continue operations in the business. Even though I get it, it's crazy scary to give up your babies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every one of those duties I had to give up felt like I was giving away a child, you know? Oh, there is no doubt. But just, the, I mean, those two short points you just you just mentioned there especially the second one there are so many things that come to mind i mean like the e-myth comes to mind the pareto principle of you know 80 20 the i remember somebody asking the questions on linkedin okay what i want you to look down at all of your tasks that you do as is a the founder you know what are a, what's a ten dollar task that you do what's a hundred dollar task that you do what's a thousand dollar task you do you know delegate the 10 and the 100 to focus on the thousand and it, it really is just this, this kind of, I mean, it is the perfect confluence of, of all these ideas and just this idea to delegate well, you Yeah, know? Totally. and it takes, it takes time. It It's an investment. It's, it's an expense on the front end that, that turns out to be an investment on the back end. You know, it's, it, it, it takes time and it's, and you have to delegate and trust, you know, after you've kind of taken your hands off of, because if you, if you delegate with the string still attached, then you know, you haven't gained what you, what you want to gain in that, but that's, it is, uh, so that let's, let's camp on that just for a second. So you, you said it's like, you know, giving one of your children away. I mean, so once you did that, was it easier the second time, regardless of what the task was after you saw that you could actually do it the first time? I think so. I had more trust in the process, mm -hmm. but when you give a task away, you're still doing it. Like, when I, when I gave sales to, to a sales team, uh, I knew these are people who are much more skilled at doing the actual selling portion. They're going to give people the proper attention. They have the time to give attention. Mm -hmm. For me before that, it was like, if someone didn't respond to my email, I was like, I'm not going to follow up with you. Like, if, if you weren't motivated enough to respond, obviously <laughs> you're, you're not a good fit. Um, but if you have a sales rep who like, this is what they do, they're, they're good at following up. You're going to close more clients. Yeah. And, grow the business more. Um, but, it's, but of course I had to train them and I had to be on every call for, for, you know, a month. Mm -hmm. And they were always asking, Hey, we have a client asking for case studies. We have a client asking what similar clients they've worked with. So I have to go and research and, and look through all that. So I, I was still very much involved. So giving something away uh, is it's painful. And then it continues to be painful, <laughs> but I, I will say, you know, after you get past that month or two of, of where all of a sudden that task starts to be taken over without your involvement. It's a hundred percent worth it from there. And, and you do have to tr just trust the process that that'll eventually come. Um, the sad part about giving away one of your, your responsibilities in your job is that 
by the time you're forced to, you're already super, super busy and you can't afford to keep doing that job yep. along with the person who's, who it's delegated to. Um, but it's just one of those things you have to put in the time and work over hours <laughs> for a better life later on. I mean, you, you could actually become your own worst enemy and, and barrier to scale. I mean, you know, you are your own bottleneck, you know, at that, at that point, if you don't delegate well and don't trust and, you know, people want to, I mean, the jobs they do, they want to own things too. They want to have responsibility. They want to be the champion for, for projects and, and products and, and, you know, certain areas of your business. And that is, you know, that is an investment that is giving them ownership and, and delegating well, but I, uh, my, my next question is, is a little bit self-serving here because I mean, LinkedIn is such an, a fascinating, um, I think lead generation space, you know, for businesses. And so the, the biggest question that I, I think I see, and, and I think the biggest mistake maybe people make when they're, especially B2B outreach is, so I send you a LinkedIn request, you make a connection. The first thing I do is I ping you with some spammy, hey, we're in the same you know, industry. We, we have this to offer. I'd love to jump on a quick call and catch up for a few minutes. And you're thinking, you, you just connected with me just to, just to pitch me. Exactly. You know, please, please help our audience that uses LinkedIn, please coach us through this process of how to do that better. Yeah. Well, first of all, LinkedIn put something or some things in place that have helped us out a lot uh, because I'm sure you've watched this for probably the last uh, three, four years, the spam on LinkedIn, the, the outreach spam has been awful. And mm. the reason why was because if you had a, a sales navigator license, it's yep. the, the premium subscription to, to LinkedIn for salespeople. Um, you could reach out to like a hundred people per day. And, and, and so what that meant was for people who were doing mass outreach spam, they had a hundred shots per day per profile that they could send out and spam the globe. So what LinkedIn did is they came back and this has been probably about a year ago, but they started putting a lot more stringent limits on it. So now you can only reach out to about 15 to 20 per day um, and with a total of about a hundred per week. And it's not a hard and fast rule obviously LinkedIn's doing something behind the scenes right. to judge the quality of your messaging, but because they cut down on that, now it's a lot harder for the mass spam to, mm -hmm. to have success. And so it's, it's forced us to do what we should have been doing all along, which is like starting real relationships. Yeah. Um, now you're talking I, email I, or connection requests? Both actually. So I would much rather send a connection request that's customized saying, Hey, here's how I know you, or here's why we, I think we should connect. Um, that's a lot softer than sending a, a, a cold in mail. If you send a cold in mail, it feels like, I, I mean, the, the difference, it, it feels like um, if you don't know someone, sending them a connection request would be like walking up to them at a party and saying like, like, hey, how's it going? Like, tell me about yourself. But sending an in mail would be more like, Hey, do you want to go on a date next week? It's like, whoa, I might be willing to, but this is, it's a little jarring. It's a little bit too much too soon. So I, I do think when you send a connection request first, uh, once you're connected to someone, you can send infinite messages mm -hmm. back and forth yep. at no cost. Yep. Uh, whereas sending someone a, an email, if you buy a, a, an upgraded license of LinkedIn, you only get so many of those mm -hmm. that you can send out at a given yep. time. So I think there's blabbering. also the idea that <laughs> I've almost given you permission by accepting your connection request. I've it's almost like a, I've moved you from an ice cold, you know, connection to a slightly lukewarm, you know, I still don't want you to spam me, but I, you know, at least I have expressed some welcomeness to, you know, to whatever that is. But, man, I, I, um, I think you're being kind on this, you know, the, the whole out, outreach thing. I, it is, it is a, a intrusive. I think to get a connection request and immediately get a spam message that right behind it. And it's, yes, it's like, you know, so coach us through how to, how to do that better. If I, you know, give me the ABC, the quick ABCs of, if I'm wanting to reach out to a, a client that I think would be a good potential client, how did, how do people do that? Well, I, I think every single connection request needs to be, thought out well this isn't something i would i want to give to 
an intern and say, Hey, go add yeah. a whole bunch of CEOs in marketing, or hire agencies. a VA and you'll do 500 of them for, you know, 50 bucks or something like that. Yeah, exactly. It, it, I, I wouldn't do that. And of course you can get a VA involved, but the process I think should be, if there's someone you want to connect to, you go, first of all, look at their activity on LinkedIn. And mm -hmm. if they happen to be active, then, uh, then go and interact with them, mm -hmm. go like, uh, uh, you know, a couple posts of theirs, not all at the same time. You don't, because every time you interact with, with something, they're going to get an email. So you don't want them to get like uh, an email. AJ liked one of your comments. AJ <laughs> liked one of your posts. AJ reach out. That's right. Yeah, it, it doesn't look great. But but think of it like we're in this for the long term. And so if you can interact with them, what happens is when someone is actively posting and they're actively sharing and contributing and they see someone's name show up over and over, it's it's like, oh, like, they feel like a friend after a little while, even mm. though you have no idea who this person is. So by the time you send a connection request, it doesn't have to, you don't have to dance around it. Like, Hey, I thought like you look like a good potential client for me. Maybe we should talk. Now your conversation is all around. I love what you shared last mm -hmm. week about on this topic. Like, you know, thanks for responding back. And like, I, I love to be connected to people like you in the industry who, who are forward thinking and yeah. prescient and, and all that. Now you're going to have a hundred percent connection request, like acceptance versus, you know, 1% from before. And so if someone's active on LinkedIn, you can use that. If they're not active, uh, I definitely still think that you can find ways and reasons to want to connect, but you will lose a hundred percent of the trust that you've built up the second you drop a sales pitch on someone mm -hmm. if they're not ready for it. Yeah. So yeah. my, my guidance for everyone is to, Every single one of these that you send out, you may be trying to put food on the table next week and try to close a deal. I get it. Um, but every one of your connection requests you, you send out, think of it as the mindset of you are building a long-term relationship that is going to last through your current quarter. It's going to last, you know, into the years and pre, you know, past company, not past future companies. Mm -hmm. um, this is a relationship that's going to serve you for the rest of your career. Don't throw it away by by sacrificing it for the short term. That, what, what great, that's sage wisdom right there. That is, that is sage advice. And, and um, I mean, it's interesting. It's like any relationship, you know, you can, you can break trust, you know, very quickly. And it is really, really hard to regain. You know, it's easy to so break true. and very hard to regain. So, and I, I, um, I mean, rising tide has one purpose and that's what actually we have to, one is to, to really highlight founders and their businesses. The second is to really provide a, a great connected network, you know, of between our guests and, and our audience. And so as we close up today, man, just take a, take a moment and just share like, who is the ideal client for B2 linked and, you know, what would be some, some ideal ways that you can serve those clients and then just wrap us up and tell us where the best place to find you online. Cool. Well, I'll try not to dwell too too much on the sales yeah, pitch side of things. It's all but, yours, brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the best customer for us is going to be a good customer of LinkedIn. Generally, that means larger budgets, larger deal size, business to business lead mm -hmm. generation. Um, there's also a ton of success in recruiting in mass. So mm. we've worked with several of the Fortune 500 specifically in uh, in recruiting candidates because they're always trying to fill positions all over the globe. Um, those are great. The bigger the budgets, the more we can do that's, that's special. But you know, anyone who's a good fit for LinkedIn ads and has a, let's say, a, a budget of over about 8K a month mm -hmm. for, for, you know, for an agency and media is going to be a great intro for us. Yeah. So comparatively, 8K LinkedIn versus 8K Facebook or 8K Instagram or 8K, you know, fill in the blank on the social media. What, what is the, what's the run of that money? And wh what is the, what's the ROI and deliverable? I mean, you know, you say it's hyper-focused. It's, you know, it's maybe it buys less, but it buys better, you know, maybe yeah. or something like that. What, how would you describe it? Yeah. When the average cost per click from LinkedIn ads in North America is somewhere between eight to $14. That's per click. So you look at Facebook in the same the same kind of audience, and you might be paying three to four dollars per click. So your your question would be, all right, AJ, is LinkedIn worth three, four, five times more than I'm paying on on Facebook? 
And what we see over and over again is uh, if you're looking just at the front end of your metrics, just your, your, your cost per lead, mm -hmm. your cost per click, Dad's your click through rate, absolutely not. Like it's, it's not going to be worth it. Uh, but when you start tracing that and watching it further down your sales process, all of a sudden it starts to look really good. Um, the reason why is if you're paying three, $4 a click on Facebook, assuming that you have the same conversion rate, um, you know, you might get like $12 leads. That's cool. On LinkedIn, you're, you're going to be paying $50, $60 for that, that same lead. Um, but when you start watching how the sales team is dealing with these, they're going to throw out 95% of the Facebook leads. Like we talked about, they're just, they're not the right people. Um, they're now names in the database for nurture, but they're not the right people to pursue for sales no. relationship. No. But LinkedIn, oh, the only people I have to disqualify are, you know, you're not using the right CRM or you're not, you know, we don't have an integration that way. And so now you're, when you're looking at, at just cost per lead, LinkedIn looks crazy expensive. We start looking at cost per sales qualified lead, mm -hmm. cost per proposal sent and your actual return on investment. Now, all of a sudden LinkedIn starts looking really good, but you know, it's only in the last few years that marketers have gotten technical enough to do that analysis, to integrate into their CRM and start running these analyses to actually focus on like cost per actual down funnel performance, rather than just seeing a cost per lead in the platform and saying, oh, better cut LinkedIn's budget. And that, I, yeah, I knew that uh, anecdotally. Uh, I mean, you can, you can bring the data to bear, you know, that, that actually proves that, but Man, what a way to wrap us up today, Jay. It's been so good to uh, to reconnect and just kind of hear your story and just see the the growth, you know, in the last couple of three years that that uh, you know between episodes. And man, I'm, I will not let the the moss grow as long next time before I bring you back on the show because I I just love your energy and just really what you bring to to LinkedIn and how visibly you know you you bring just really good content and. I just encourage our listeners to, you know, follow link, follow AJ Wilcox on, on LinkedIn, um, join one of the 38,000, you know, raving fans that he's got on there that, uh, that learn from him each week and, um, and go to b2linked.com. That's the website that uh, AJ's company and man, thanks again, just really taking time. It's, it's been a pleasure to, to reconnect and really once again, just playing your part and helping all boats rise in a rising tide. AJ, thanks again, buddy. Well, Kevin, thanks so much. I'm, I'm, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to get to reconnect and have me back anytime for a virgin trip. Another episode in the books. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on iTunes and YouTube. As always, thanks for listening to Rising Tide.